Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. And today I'm really excited to talk to Daniel today, who is a longtime big tech veteran. He went to college in the Midwest, in Ohio and Wisconsin, which is cool because I also grew up in Michigan. We have that Midwest connection. And then he spent almost 11 years at Microsoft, then almost eight years at Facebook starting in 2012. And now he is the head of instruction at Formation, which is a fellowship program designed to help engineers land the best jobs. So Daniel, thanks so much for joining. Yeah, thanks for having me. I want to start off by talking about what you do every single day right now at Formation, which is helping engineers land these really top opportunities. You have a pretty unique perspective about the interview prep process that engineers go through. I'd love just for you to share what you think about the current state of landing a big tech job and what are the big mistakes that you see engineers make in their preparation? I think it really comes down to the way a lot of people approach interview prep is misaligned with the skills you actually need to do a job. I can understand a little bit of like how people get there. Like interviews are scary. There's a natural human desire to find an easy way through learning anything. I think that's normal and natural, right? And that actually creates a really big business opportunity for a lot of different people. How long has there been like self-help books, right? Like, oh, solve these problems about yourself, you know? And that's really how I see the interview prep marketplace today. It's mostly attempts at shortcuts, really, is what it comes down to, of how you can succeed in interviews without a whole lot of work. Fundamentally, these are all doomed to fail. Occasionally, somebody's going to get lucky, but fundamentally, they don't work. And why do they not work? A lot of these interview prep programs, they take the following shape. There are a list of some number of problems. 75 seems to be a magic number or perceived as a magic number. And it's like, if you do these problems or if you know the answers to these problems, you'll be okay in interviews. And that's fundamentally not true. And I don't think that's a contrarian viewpoint at all because at the end of the day, you're unlikely to get asked those questions in an interview. So knowing yeah. the answers to those problems helps you to a degree commensurate with your actual understanding of how those solutions work and how you arrive at them. There's a process yeah. step because in the interview, your interviewer is gonna ask you a question. It may or may not be related to one of those questions or it might be related but disguised in a clever way. And now you have to actually be the engineer in the room. What do engineers do? They solve problems creatively. They don't know the answers at the outset. That's really what's required to succeed in interviews in general. I actually do think these lists of practice problems have some value. The value is, in my mind, is that they're great practice lists. Like I look at all these lists of problems and, and programs, this is gonna help. I think the difference is 75 problems is not enough problems to actually learn. If you already have the skills, 75 problems is a good brush up. But you're not yeah. you're unlikely to actually learn and master the underlying skills in a way that's truly generalizable in 75 problems. I think your critique is interesting because it sounds like it's mostly directed at the shallow interview prep companies that say, hey, we're going to get you there in as short a time period as possible. And it's not really a depth of understanding in the way that you would want. But I think the other side of the argument is that the way these big tech companies interview is essentially a tax on a software engineer. Like you don't really do reverse linked list or binary search tree problem on the job. And so it's the fault of the company in how they structure the interview rather than the prep company, which is selling the pickaxe to the miner. I somewhat disagree. It depends on how you evaluate a candidate's response. If what the company is doing by asking a leak code style problem or like an ACM programming contest style problem, if what they're evaluating is, can you do it? Like, did you get the answer? Then you're right. Because those problems don't often come up on the job. So you're, you're asking a question and evaluating with a rubric that doesn't really apply. However, what's really cool about a lot of these problems is that if you really dig into and observe the process that the candidate uses to understand the problem and then break it down, like even something like reversing a linked list, which by the way, should never be asked in an interview because it's a classic practice problem like that everybody should do. Right. It's a great problem. I love that problem, but like it's not an interview question. It's still a great example. If you break that down and methodically work through it, that gives me confidence as the interviewer that you'll be able to do that with other problems on the job. So knowing how to reverse a linked list, 
does not apply. Being able to methodically make progress on a problem, like that's a great one because you really have to think through carefully and make sure that you're doing the assignments in the right order and so that you're not overwriting something or like there's all kinds of ways you can make mistakes on that problem in particular. And yeah. if somebody is a detailed enough problem solver and fluent enough coder that they can do that problem, that they can solve that problem and write the code, that's a good indication that they're going to be able to methodically work through other problems on the job. Like an interview is always going to be a contrived environment. And a yeah. good interviewer, a company with a good, well-designed interview process, is not focused on the answers. They're focused on the things they see in your process to arrive at the answers. That indicates if you do those things on the job, you'll be successful at solving the problems at hand and writing code effectively with a minimum number of bugs, right? Like that's really what yeah. a company should be looking for. And you can test that with these kinds of problems. And I actually see this all the time in interviews. I see candidates fall over because of this. They know answers to a lot of problems. Sometimes they even recognize that the problem I asked them is sort of similar to one of these things that they know. And I see people all the time start to regurgitate code and then are unable to modify it to meet the problem at hand. And you get some points for recognizing the similarity between you know, my problem and what you've done before. But if you don't understand them well enough to modify them, then you're not getting the job done. It's one of the common kind of failure modes that I see in interviews. And I think yeah. that's directly the result of people focusing on answers, on learning answers, rather than practicing the process. Yeah, I, I love that framing also because, I mean, like you said, interviews are contrived. They are an imperfect representation of what you do on the job, but that doesn't mean they're void of signal. When I was at Pinterest and other companies, there was an evaluation of the interview performance. There's another axis too, which was confidence in that evaluation. Right? Like, how strongly do you feel about the rating that you gave this person? I'm really curious for you, after having done so many interviews, how refined is your BS detector? Does that make sense? Like, so if someone has done a really, really good job with Blind 75, wherever they get that magic list of questions, if they have like regurgitated all of those really well, I'm curious how refined is your ability to suss that out and say, oh, this person, like, it's like a balloon. And if I prod it a little bit, it'll all kind of like deflate. How much confidence do you have in being able to really judge that? It's really not hard because let's say I give them a problem that's either exactly one of those or is really, really close and they solve it quickly. When you solve a problem quickly, that inherently means there's not a lot of signal for me as the interviewer. Maybe you're wicked smart and you actually did solve the problem from first principles like in your head and then you just like write the code or, you know, modern day Zoom interview type the code. Even in that case, I didn't learn anything about the process. So I have to ask you another question another mode. Let's say, like, and this is kind of what I already described. If you really don't understand those solutions, you know them, but you don't really understand them. You don't understand the patterns and processes. If I asked you something that's a variation on it and you get the structure of the code very quickly, but then you fail to understand where you need to change the thing you know into the solution to the problem that I asked, that tells me that you've studied the wrong things that you've learned answers rather than practiced your process. Yeah. And that gives me low confidence. Well, it gives me high confidence in the signal. <laughs> it gives me low confidence in the candidate's ability to actually do the job. Because when they get to the job and I hand them like, you know, go solve this bug or go add this feature, that wasn't on grind 75 list. So are they going to be able to do it? I think that's a really good takeaway. So takeaway is you can't fool Daniel. Other interviewers of his caliber, you just can't fool them. You have to have some depth behind your thinking process over outcome. I think that's a really good takeaway. You can't just regurgitate the leak code problems that you've gone through. It can work sometimes. What I want to do, like as a candidate, like if I'm interviewing for a job, is I want to walk in the door confident or like log into the Zoom, confident yeah. that I'm likely to make significant progress or completely solve any arbitrary problem that they're likely to ask. Yeah. I know that sounds daunting, but if you actually focus your practice around the problem solving process, you have a much higher likelihood of getting there. Yeah, that's right. So emulate the interview process in your practice as well. It can't just be like coding in isolation all the time. Yeah, I think there's a big step that I think people are missing. When I see people practice 
problems. You know, they pull something off of leak code or they pull something off of one of these magic lists. They do the problem and they think they're done when their code runs and passes all the tests. That's when the actual self-improvement process has the real possibility of starting. People stop when their solution works. No matter what resources you're using, if you're not giving yourself 10 to 20 minutes after solving the problem to really internalize and understand the structures of what's going on in that, you know, not memorizing the code, but understanding the structure and, and what went into that and how it works and why it works and what are the component patterns. If you're not doing that, then you're wasting your time. Okay, well, Daniel, this has been super insightful. I feel like I love the amount of time that you've spent in these huge companies that gives you a really novel perspective. And you are clearly an expert when it comes to interview prep and doing well in that whole process of getting into the company. I'll leave a link for your LinkedIn along with formation.dev in the description. If you enjoyed this, Daniel actually has a lot more content that we have exclusively available on Tara. So jointar.com. I'll again, leave a link for that in the description. You can check out Daniel's masterclass about how to succeed in a new role, a new team, a new job. Um, I think Daniel, you've done that clearly many times in your career. So he really is one of the best people in the world to talk about that. So I'll leave a link for that as well in the description. Daniel, thank you so much for being here. Anything else you want to add? No, just thanks for having me. This was a lot of fun. Awesome. Cool. Well, thanks so much. And thanks everyone for watching. See you next time.